The Tom Woods Show, episode 2308. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. I'm giving away three free courses from my Liberty Classroom. One of them is ex-Marxist Michael Rechtenwald teaching you about critical theory so you can understand leftism and fight it better, as well as our course on how Alexander Hamilton screwed up America and the history of the conservative and libertarian movements. Check it out at 3freecourses.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. I'm really happy to have Laura Davidson here with us. She is the author of the brand new book, The Logic of Freedom, Free Will, Human Nature, and the Rational Argument for a Genuinely Free World. Laura, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. It's a great honor and privilege to be on your show. Well, that's very kind of you to say, but it's funny. I feel the opposite. I feel like the privilege is mine because long before you wrote this book, I knew who you were because you've written for the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. And surely, I feel like I've surely read at least two articles of yours in there. I must be remembering that correctly, am I? Yes. I think I have about 12 articles up there altogether. Oh, okay. Okay. Sure. Okay. I just yeah. absolutely double checking. So I remember the first, I know you've done, and I didn't go back and I probably should have, if I were a responsible podcast host, I would have looked at this in advance, but I'm doing it all on the fly here. I seem to recall you writing about uh, at least one article about banking, fractional reserve banking, free banking, yeah. monetary disequilibrium that the free bankers talk about and trying to make sense of it from, let's say, a hard Rothbardian perspective. Am I remembering that right? Yes, yes. It was against fraction or the free banking. Yes, right. And I actually won an award for that okay. particular article. Okay, well deserved. Yeah. Because I read that article and I thought, who is, I'm not kidding you. I said, who is this Laura Davidson? Because I figured <laughs> anybody who would write an article that hardcore and that good, I must know already. There's so few people in the world who would have written it, I would know them all. So I remember thinking, is this a pen name? Who is this <laughs> real Laura Davidson? You know, all right, Tom DiLorenzo, you can take your mask off. <laughs> you know, I thought this can't possibly be. But somehow I'm glad to know that our movement was even larger than I thought. And people I didn't know were actually out there doing really good work. Then I found out, number one, you've written this book, so I want to promote it. But secondly, that you're in my school of life community. I thought, so, And then you're saying how pleased you are to be on my show. Look, I am honored to have Laura Davidson on my show. That's the way I think about it. Well, thank you very much. You're very kind. So let's get into the argument here, and we'll spend a little bit of time, of course, on the somewhat vexed question of free will. And I have heard arguments for free will based on, you know, coming from philosophy of mind, which is an area that you delve into a bit here. But at the very beginning, can you spell out what it is that you see as the connection between whether or not human beings really have free will and whether or not the free society is a moral necessity of some kind? Well, I think that you actually have to believe that you have free will if you believe in a free society. If you don't believe in free will, the opposite of free will is causal determinism. And the fact of the matter is that most scientists and philosophers today, I think, believe in some form of strict determinism. And if you believe in that, then you can't really be held morally responsible for what you do. And so I think that that leads to nihilism, feelings of hopelessness, and it also can lead to relativism as well. Because if you think everything is determined and you can't be held morally responsible, well, then you just happen to murder that guy <laughs> because you're unlucky and perhaps we didn't feel sorry for you. But one thing that determinists do is they always argue that there should be some kind of laws. Now, why there should be laws, I don't know, because why they argue for that is because if you're in a deterministic world, surely the laws are always determined to exist anyway. So they always argue for that. But then the question arises, well, what kind of laws? And then it's just sort of subjective what kind of laws they would go for. So I maintain that the only way to have objective laws, universal laws, which is the principle that I'm trying to prove in this book, that the only way to do that is if you assume that we have free will. All right. So now let's go back to the very beginning and talk about this. I think most people who haven't been influenced by academia or academic philosophy probably don't give the question much thought. But if they do, I think most people would be inclined to think that our subjective experiences, which certainly lead us to the impression that we are making choices, 
are probably sufficient for most people to indicate that they have free will. They feel themselves exercising it. Exactly. And so they don't feel the need to explore the question further. But as a philosopher, you do need to explore the question a bit further because not every impression you have is a true one. The old pencil in the glass of water problem, the pencil appears broken in the water, but I know that that particular sense perception is not right. So I do have to go a little bit further. So how do you take on determinists who would say that, and by the way, let me say this in parentheses, maybe even before we get into the how you take on, yeah. I sometimes wonder why somebody is driven to argue for determinism. Now, it could be that they've looked at all the evidence and they're led to the conclusion that determinism is true. I don't rule that out, but I wonder if in some cases it's people who feel like if they don't believe in determinism, then they must have to believe in some type of spiritual nature of man, something that is supernatural, something that lacks a physical explanation, and they don't want to go down that road because they're afraid of where it'll take them. Yeah, I think there is something in that. I think it's also that people just, you know, scientists and philosophers, they look out upon the world and they see everything is subject to cause and effect and subject to the physical laws of nature. And so they take this reductionist view that biological processes can be reduced to chemical, electrochemical processes, and these in turn can be reduced to the laws of physics. And so why should the operation of the mind be any different? So therefore the mind just works according to an algorithm, like a computer. This is something that Yuval Noah Harari talks about in his book, Homo Deus, Man or God. He's the sidekick of Klaus Schwab. So there, I think that there's that aspect, and there is also the aspect that, yes, as you say, they don't want to accept some aspect of spirituality because you do have to go, I think, into the spiritual. And I do delve into that very briefly at the end of my book, the spiritual aspect of all this. So, yes, I think those are the reasons that they grab onto this determinism. But, of course, they're wholly inconsistent because they certainly got to live out their lives as though determinism is true. And that poses all kinds of problems, contradictions, but that by itself doesn't prove that we have free will. And then, of course, there are others who say, well, free will is compatible with determinism, but in those cases, they simply redefine what determinism and or free will mean. For example, they say free will is the freedom to act, but it's not. It's the freedom to think. And so even a prisoner in chain or a slave might not be free to act, but they have free will because they're free to think. So that doesn't wash compatibilism. And then one other view, which is quantum indeterminism, but if you accept, which is the idea that the brain is operated by quantum mechanics and chance, but there's always an element of probability involved in that. And the question is then what determines those probabilities? And even those probabilities determined by the laws of physics or they're determined by the individual as a consequence of free will. So that doesn't get rounded either. So what I wanted to do was to prove free will from first principles. I don't know if I was successful, but that was what I was trying to do with a novel kind of argument. Well, can you, given that my show is not a Joe Rogan three-hour show where we can go (laughs) through your whole book, obviously it will be limited. But I think this question of free will, I'm trying to think if I've ever, maybe I covered it a little bit with Mike Humor, but otherwise I don't think it's ever come up on the program. So I wouldn't mind spending a disproportionate amount of time in the episode on no, this fine. subject. Yeah. So how does one from first principles attempt to demonstrate something like this, which even though, as I say, there seems to be a very compelling subjective case yeah. for us having free will, it does seem like a difficult, I mean, I think the determinist argument is a very depressing and unpleasant one, but I think also it, it can be a rather tough nut to crack. So how do you crack it? Well, I start by looking at the mind-body problem, because this is an ancient problem. And it's the question of how do we get consciousness? Now, there are some people that claim, be the physicalists, who claim that consciousness is simply a different manifestation of matter, that it supervenes onto matter, so that an example of supervenience would be, say, a picture made out of a thousand little dots, like in a dot matrix printer, and the picture produces something new, but there's still a one-to-one relationship between the dots and the picture. So that kind of supervenience still implies a deterministic world if we translate that to the concept of the mind and body. Then there are those who claim that if you arrange matter in a certain 
pattern, a new kind of consciousness emerges. And then finally, there are the panpsychists who say that matter is consciousness or a form of consciousness. And that idea, the very old idea, it was popular in the 19th century, but it's actually sort of coming back a little bit now. Certain philosophers like Galen Strauss and Thomas Nagel, and I think David Chalmers as well, they sort of hint at it. They're not fully committed to it, but that is a possibility. So that really doesn't answer the question. We're still sort of hovering around the central issue. But then the other thing that I wanted to look at was the evolution of consciousness, because it's quite clear that we're not the only beings to possess consciousness, but there's a continuous sort of scale of consciousness, from very sort of primitive organisms like worm, up through things like frog, which have sort of spatial awareness, and then mammals, which have an awareness of time as well, and possibly concepts of cause and effect in a limited sense, through to human beings, which have self-awareness and reason. And this has evolved over time. So the critical question is, how do we go from something that many can perceive things to a being that has reason and self-awareness and an ego and has free will? as a will. And how do we prove that that will is free? Now, there are various theories as to how we evolve perception. One is from the German philosopher Thomas Messinger. And he talks about the consciousness tunnel, that we live in this consciousness tunnel. And the reality we perceive is not the same as the reality out there. It's a mere shadow of the reality, a sort of three-dimensional shadow, if you like. And that idea is a very old idea. It goes back to Plato's allegory of the cave, where you have these prisoners chained to the, to the floor of the cave and all they can see is the wall opposite. And they're just shadows projected onto the wall, but they believe that that's the true reality. They've lived all their lives that way. What they're really seeing is just shadows projected by people and objects moving in front of a fire behind them that they can't see. So imagine our audience would live in this sort of consciousness tunnel, the walls of the tunnel, are like the walls of the cave, and it's a tunnel because as we move forward in time, or as we move forward through the tunnel, that's what we anticipate in looking back with our memory. Now, one other philosopher who I really admire, I think is one of the best philosophers of the Enlightenment, and that's Immanuel Kant. And Kant also talks about the idea of there being a sort of what's called the noumenal realm, the world of things in themselves, the true reality that's out there. And what Kant says is that we can never really experience this noumenal realm. We experience only the realm of phenomena. And so he distinguishes between these two kinds of things. But what he also says is that space and time are not actually out there in the noumenal realm. Now, this is a very complicated subject, which he talks about in Critique of Pure Reason, which was written in 1782, I think, a very difficult book. And he tried to write an easier version in Prolegomena to Future Metaphysics a couple of years later. It's still not easy reading, but not bedtime reading. But in it, he explains how space and time are just pure intuitions of the mind. And he gives various reasons for this. We probably don't have time to go into all the reasons. But what he says is, I mean, essentially, space and time form the fabric onto which we project our reality. So you can think of it like they form the wall of this consciousness tunnel. Are you with me so far? Yes. Okay. And so one of the things that he explains is, this kind of explains why something like geometry works. There's a famous dialogue in Plato called Mino, and Socrates goes to the house of Mino. He takes the slave boy and says to the slave boy, I can show you, or I can say to Mino, I can show you how this slave boy knows Pythagoras' theorem. And he asks this boy a series of questions, and the boy introduces Pythagoras' theorem without knowing anything about triangles. So the question is, how does a geometry like that work? We don't have to go out into the world measuring right angle triangles to know that the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of the other two sides. And the answer is because space is an intuition in our mind, and all we're doing with geometry is working out the structure, the scaffolding onto which we project our reality. So, of course, it will have real world relevance. But this is something that Kant refers to as a synthetic a priori. It's a priori because it's intuitive, it's innate, it's from first principles, and it's synthetic because it has real-world relevance. This is something that David Hume, one of Kant's contemporaries, didn't understand or didn't appreciate. So space, logical deductions from space, give rise to propositions of geometry, 
And what Camp says is that deductions from time give rise to arithmetic. And if we take space and time together, we can form deductions that give rise to pure mathematics, which can be applied to moving objects in the real world. And so then he goes one step further. And he says, well, if time is an intuition in the mind, then causality, which occurs in time, must also be a concept in the mind, the concept of the understanding, he calls it. So you know, David Hume couldn't explain why causality empirically. He just said we observe constant conjunction and make necessary connection to custom and habit. But what Kant is doing, he says, well, no, causality, the effect, cause and effect, is simply a faculty of the mind, a concept of the understanding that we impose on the world and we make sense of it. So a being from another planet, let's say, with an intelligent mind might interpret the very same reality in a completely different way. But this is simply the way in which we interpret reality. Now, unlike other animals, other animals have intuitions of space, time, and causality. But we are the only animal that has reason. And reason gives rise to ideas. It allows us to think abstractly and use deduction to flesh out the logical implications of space, time, and causality. But it cannot help us understand the world beyond the phenomenal. It can't help us understand that noumenal realm precisely because space, time, and causality don't exist in the noumenal realm, in the world of things in themselves. And attempting to use reason as though space, time, and causality exist in that noumenal realm gives rise to puzzling paradoxes. Things like, well, why did time ever begin? Why will it never end? Why does space go on forever? Why do we have when we look at matter, we find ever more fundamental particles. And we live in a world of cause and effect, and yet our thoughts don't seem to be caused. And so this last thing, the world we live in a world of cause and effect, and yet our thoughts don't seem to be caused, is the key. Because if we analyze the mind scientifically as a phenomenal object, we see that the mind exists in space and time, and it has a sort of neural net, and we see all these electrochemical signals whizzing around, and we can correlate certain parts of the brain with certain thoughts, and the neural correlates with consciousness. And everything seems to be caused by physical processes, and that's the view of the determinant. But when we think about our own mind and our own thoughts, they don't appear to be caused by anything. And I maintain that the reason that they don't is because our thoughts, are the one thing in the universe that we can experience as a thing itself in the noumenal realm. And our thoughts do not exist in space. They have no spatial dimension. Our thoughts don't exist in time. We can have a series of thoughts in time, but an individual thought has no time dimension to it. And it doesn't appear to be caused. And it, the reason is because our thoughts are existing in this world of reality. It's not an illusion. If anything is an illusion, it's the world outside that we experience as phenomena, including that of our own bodies, which are the mere shadows, the shadows on the wall that we experience through space, time, and causality. But our thoughts, we don't experience that way. And so therefore, we have free will because they are not caused by anything. We're experiencing an aspect, one aspect of the numeral. It's the only aspect that we can experience. We can't experience any other aspect of it, but our thoughts are in the numeral realm. And that's why we have free will. If I were a philosopher, I could pick holes in that, but I'm yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> Nor am I inclined to, by the way. I am very much inclined to your conclusion. Now, I realize that in proceeding in this way, I am hopping over a substantial portion of your book. But on the other hand, remember, my view is because I'm not Joe Rogan. And by the way, I don't mean to take his name in vain. I like Joe Rogan and absolutely nothing against him. but. I think after you hear, although a lot of times you'll have an author on for three hours and barely talk about the person's book and the author gets annoyed, not publicly, but afterward, I can't believe my book never came up. Still, if you were to listen to a podcast for three hours about somebody's book, you might think, well, I basically read the book. But on the Tom Woods show, you know you're just getting the surface and you have to go out and read it. So that will be the benefit, Laura Davidson, of not covering everything yeah. is that people <laughs> will be more inclined to go read it. So to. what I'd like to do is, can we hop over, because the ending chapters are on subject areas that are maybe more readily grasped by ordinary libertarians, and you know, you're trying to make sense of what is the correct kind of social order, 
And you begin right away by saying free will implies morality. And you go from there because you're saying if you didn't have free will, we couldn't judge your actions to be moral or immoral. If they're determined, we don't say that a washing machine is morally culpable if it ruins your shirt. We'd have to say the same thing about a human being who didn't have free will. So free will implies morality. How do we go from there or do we go from there to the non-aggression principle? Okay. Well, I introduced the concept of entropy and is the amount of disorder, randomness and uncertainty in the system, and it increases as heat disperses. This is implied by the second law of thermodynamics. And it's a pervasive feature of the universe. Things just decay. But where we can harness energy, we can reverse the process of entropy and create order out of chaos. In fact, life is a biological engine that does precisely that. But we are unique as human beings because we have reason and we can understand the physical laws and we can employ those physical laws to reduce entropy external to our bodies. And we call these goods. And of course, not everything we do does that, but our entire civilization is built upon harnessing energy and employing the physical laws of nature to reduce entropy. But I maintain that there's other kinds of entropy having to do with mental entropy and social entropy. Now, in the mental entropy I equate that to long-term happiness or human flourishing or what the Greeks, ancient Greeks referred to as, as eudaimonia. I'll sort of skip over that a little bit, but I think that what's important to understand is that in order to string together actions that are going to be successful in life in order to achieve happiness, and let me just say this is not a praxeological statement, but in order to be able to do that, then I think we need to have self-discipline, which is the kind of sort of rules, objective rules that we impose on ourselves and to be able to do that, we need virtue. I think the ancient Greeks had the right idea of virtue. Things like wisdom, courage, temperance, and fairness, justice, and things like that. But in the social sphere, which is really what we're talking about here, I think that we also want to reduce entropy. Now, if we look at the non-aggression principle, there are various arguments that are put forward as to why we should adhere to the non-aggression principle. And I don't find them particularly overwhelmingly convincing. There's the moral argument, but, you know, there are umpteen different moral perspectives and nobody can agree, or at least most people don't agree. The object here is to try to make a, an argument with which nobody can disagree. And then the deontological argument, which is the argument that we have a duty, but that's not really an argument. That's sort of Kantian argument. And then there's the argument that it maximizes social utility. But social utility is a really problematical concept because how do we add up? Um, utility. There's no cardinal or numerical measure of utility, and let alone measuring interpersonal utility. Yeah, you could say that non-aggression principle, if you adhere to it, then you only have voluntary exchanges and the participants in those exchanges both benefit. But we can't make any statement on whether or not that social utility is increased as a whole. How do we know, for example, that taking $1,000 from somebody who's relatively well off and giving it to somebody poor doesn't make the poorer person happier than the loss of happiness in the person from whom we take the thousand dollars. And then there's some various other arguments, which I don't find particularly convincing. So I maintain that the justification for the non-aggression principle lies in reducing social entropy in the form of eliminating or reducing the uncertainty from the threat of aggression. And I introduced this idea called the universal threat axiom as the basis for the non-aggression principle. Now, certainly being a victim of aggression implies a loss of utility, but if you live with the constant uncertainty that you could be threatened with violence at any time, then I think that that definitely interferes with the string of actions that you need to pursue in order to lead a happy life. And everybody in society is under some kind of threat, physical aggression from someone else, no matter how small that might be. And I maintain that it is axiomatic that everybody should want to reduce the threat of aggression, the threat of aggression occurring to themselves. So, you know, moral relativists might not like the non-aggression principle and they might violate it, but they cannot logically argue that it does not reduce uncertainty for everybody and that this is universally good for the human race. So by observing the non-aggression principle, it does eliminate the loss of utility for those who would otherwise be the victim of aggression. But more importantly, it reduces uncertainty for everyone so that one can go about one's life unhampered to the maximum extent possible. 
And thirdly, it does create an ordinary society, it creates a free market, which gives rise to a price structure that actually reflects the demands of the consumers against the supply of, of resources. And indeed, uh, my Rothbard called the free market a beautiful, orderly, and harmonious structure. He could have said a structure low in social entropy, because that's what entropy is. Entropy is disorder and randomness and uncertainty. And so we see that basically these laws that we observe in life, the physical laws of nature, the rules we apply, the subjective rules we apply in the form of self-discipline, and also the rules or the laws that flow objectively from the non-aggression principle apply in all three areas of life. So if we want to produce physical goods, we need to understand the physical laws, laws of nature, but we also need self-discipline. And we also need to be able to conduct it in producing goods in an environment where we're not being aggressed again. If we want long-term contentment or flourishing, eudaimonia, whatever you want to call it, we need to employ self-discipline, but we also need to understand physical laws so that we can produce goods, which also contribute to our happiness. And we also need to live in an environment of uncertainty because uncertainty and anxiety are detrimental to happiness. And then finally, in order to create a an environment low in social entropy, we need the non-aggression principle, but we also need self-discipline so that we don't lose our temper and get angry with other people and violate the non-aggression principle. And we need to understand the laws of nature as well, physical laws, because to facilitate physical exchange and division of labor. So all of these sort of things work synergistically to reduce entropy in our lives. And I maintain that reducing entropy in both the physical, the mental, and the social sphere is fundamental to our existence and totally in keeping with our humanity as rational beings. Let me ask you a more of a meta question, let's say. How would you situate your book among the existing libertarian literature? That is to say, what was missing in it that made you say, there's a piece of the puzzle that needs to be added here? Yeah, I always felt that people were sort of saying, well, we have to believe in the non-aggression principle, but I never felt there was a rational justification for it. How do we convince other people with a rational argument? Now, I admit that not everybody is going to be swayed by a rational argument, that if we are to give a rational argument for why we should adhere to the non-aggression principle, then what should it be? And I wanted to show how the non-aggression principle is in keeping with our humanity and entirely consistent with the life of a rational being. And then uh, that if another entity from another planet that was also rational and had the same kind of similar structure of mind that we do, that they do precisely the same thing that they would adhere. So I think that what this means is that the more we adhere to the non-aggressive principle, the more human we are, and the more we ignore it, and the more we regress into animalistic behavior. And that's not what it means to be human. You can say, well, why should we be more human? And I suppose you could argue along those lines. But I think if you want to be human, you have you have to subscribe to that principle. And I wanted to prove why that would be so. You know, it's a commonplace to recall that Aristotle used to, and far from alone among the ancients, emphasize that reason was the distinguishing feature of human beings. Now, you say that somebody out there could say, well, who says I need to live like a human being? Well, I don't really want to have a conversation with somebody like that. No. If you want to live like a cow, go ahead and <laughs> chew cut in a field. And there are people who do. <laughs> yeah, some of them do, right? I mean, go ahead, but the rest of us want to be part of society. But yeah. one of the things that the Aristotelian liberals pulled from that observation was, if that really is true, then if Aristotle wants to be true to himself then he should also favor a society like the one you're describing, because in that society, we interact with each other on the basis of reason alone. We interact with each other without a coercive apparatus, using something other than reason to resolve disputes or to decide, well, we're going to use these resources of society in this manner rather than that one. Those are decided through violence or threats of violence and coercively. But if reason is the distinguishing feature of human beings, then our society should use that distinguishing feature and not resort to something barbaric. Exactly. So there it is. It's already there. 
Exactly. But I don't know that he wanted to pull that out. Now, we don't have to talk about Aristotle necessarily. I'm not sure he was prepared <laughs> to pull that out, although I know Fred Miller at, oh, geez, now was he at Ball State? I can't remember where he was, but Fred Miller did a lengthy study of Aristotle where he claimed to pull out at least some rudiments of classical liberalism from Aristotle while conceding that Aristotle doesn't use the vocabulary of the classical liberals. You can still get some... Oh, basic yeah. ideas of it. He's yeah. not a pure communitarian. No, no. And you're absolutely right. And of course, Murray Rothbard, who's Mr. Libertarian, he was a big fan of Aristotle, Aristotelian. So, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it all does go back to Aristotle and not to Plato. Plato, we could use his allegory of the cave and stuff like that, but Plato had a very different concept of justice and how the world should be run. I mean, he sort of more or less wanted a kind of totalitarian system. But Aristotle, yeah, I think I agree with you on that. It's Definitely. true, but, but yet, but yet, there is still though something in the metaphysics of Plato that I think militates against full totalitarianism. If you really believe yeah. that there yeah. are eternal forms and that justice is one yeah. of them, then exactly. no regime can just invent justice and say, "Oh, it's the, it's the exact opposite of what the previous regime said it was." You know that it doesn't work that way. We yeah. have to use our reason to try to approximate, get close to what it's all about. Now, we're kind of coming up against the limits of the time of the episode, so I think it may be necessary for you to, if I may trespass on your time further, to return and hash out some further material in this book with us, if I could prevail upon you to do that? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, so we will take this up again, because there's so many interesting topics and subtopics in here that deserve a lengthier exposition, but for now... I'll say you are going to get something that's refreshingly original. It's not just a repackaging of other books you've read, but it really is an original contribution to our literature. And it's called, once again, The Logic of Freedom, Free Will, Human Nature, and the Rational Argument for a Genuinely Free World. I'll link to it at tomwoods.com slash 2308. Laura, thanks so much for your time. Oh, thank you so much, Tom. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.